Hello, welcome back to Speed Demon Painting. Today we are taking a look at the Xenophon Battle Fleet set, which was kindly sent to me by War Cradle Studios for review for Dystopian Wars. Now this box is one that is a traditional Battle Fleet box set, the ones that I used to have a lot of when uh, Dystopian Wars was being released, meaning it will contain one large resin ship along with two plastic sprues that make up some parts as well that you should be using on your resin ships to complete it. Now this box does not come with any build instructions, but it does come with this pamphlet that has QR codes on there that uh, lead you to the website where you can find the build instructions and also to the newly released game uh, Armored Clash, which will be coming out at the end of this month. The box also comes with a couple of bases. These bases are used for uh, SRS tokens because one of the variants you can make with the flagship and also the ammo frigates are actually SRS launchers so that you can use those. It also comes of course with a baggie of resin and like I said two frontline plastic sprues in this case. Now these frontline plastic sprues have been updated during their cycle and this is actually the first set that I got since that update so all of the new bits and bobs that uh, you would expect on the more modern sprues can be found on this one because well this is a very recent box so you can find them on there. You will be able to build three Merion sort of drone frigates out of them along with uh, a cruiser as well uh, to your liking. It comes with two of the heavy weapons that are traditionally used on the Châtelet I believe and uh, the uh, Antarctica Superiority Cruiser, you get the Sturginium Agitator and the Heavy Particle Cannon if I'm not mistaken. You can use these uh, weapons on one of the uh, resin uh, ships as well, one of the flagships, but be wary that you will not be able to build uh, the Antarctica or Châtelet if, with one of those sprues at least if you decide to go that route. Other than that you get three of uh, different variants of weapons such as these particle cannons, uh, the oscillators and uh, I believe there's the pulse emitters as well on this sprue. I always have to check with all these crazy enlightened weapons. At any rate, uh, the Enlightened and any other factions, magnetization is the key to make sure that you can swap out all of those weapons rather easily. Um, same with the Merion frigates, although those are more difficult to actually magnetize. You'll have to put a little bit of sprue tab in there in order to fit your magnet, or you should uh, use blue tack, which is also an option. The small bit here is the Etheric Lance that comes into three of the six variants that you can make with these frontline cruisers, or you can just use this back bit, which is another um, sort of heavy weapon slot hardpoint where you can put all those ball turrets in there. Speaking of those ball turrets, if you do not like magnetizing them, they hold in place just fine using a bit of blue tack, so that's always an option as well. Now onto the resin bits. There's not that many small little components for this ship. Uh, it's quite uh, reasonable. Uh, it all glues down to this uh, one giant hull, which as you can see is a one piece cast. So removing the, the uh, mold lines is fairly tricky. You just have to run your knife at the bottom of it. On top of that, you get six of these little things which are used on the ammo frigates, but also one of the configurations of the flagship. Now it's a bit of a shame that they only included six of them because if you're using them for uh, one of the flagships, ships you will be losing two of them and I would have much rather seen eight of them so you can still make all of your different ammo frigates. The hull had a minimal amount of flashing and as you can see it has this small border at uh, the bottom. The flashing is easily removed if you just take a craft knife and uh, slice it off. The same with the, the bottom bit, uh, just uh, run your blade across it and it'll be fine. The top bit is where the different uh, configurations for this ship will uh, fit into. There is one that will take the heavy, the super heavy weapon turret uh, that is found on the plastic spruce but you can also make variants using this a small bit it, that will need to have that uh, other bridge fit on or glued on top of it rather. Um, shouldn't be too difficult to magnetize these, although again blue tack can help as well if you do not feel the need to do so. And then these uh, smaller, well, uh, ammo frigate parts, these launcher uh, base, they fit into the smaller slots as well. Um, there is one tricky thing which is this uh, sort of uh, radar dish which I suppose Poles works as a Newton void engine, uh, can also be placed on top of uh, the bridge. You definitely want to use blue tack for that one because otherwise you'll be destroying some of that lovely detail that is not used in one of the other configurations. So even if you are pro magnetizing, I think that is going to be a bit where uh, yeah, blue tack is your only option. 
And the only two last pieces you have to fit on there are the exhaust pipes that uh, yeah, are very easy to slot in. You don't really need any build instructions for those. The total build options for the main flagship are actually threefold. You can get the Kepler Superiority Battlecruiser, the Low Fast Explorer, and I believe the third one was uh, the Xenophon Battlecruiser, which is actually what the box set is named after. I personally decided to go for the Low Fast Explorer. I'll be going over the rules with you in a second, and uh, I'll explain why I chose that one. It is the one that acts both as a carrier and also has that Newton Void engine at the top, and I personally think that is the most interesting build you can make out of the three of them. And as a small little tidbit, this is a new little item I recently bought at the Crysis Wargaming convention. It's called a Flexi File. This was not sent to me by War Cradle Studios, but it is an amazingly handy little tool which has this sort of flexible arm where you can put in uh, yeah, a little bit of uh, sandpaper. And that one really is handy to sort of uh, grind down that uh, bottom part of it, but also the round turrets are very easy to file down. And because it's so flexible, it doesn't tend to overshave plastic off. The channel isn't just about the models though, we are also taking a look at the new Orbat, the 3.07 Orbat for the Enlightened, and you can see that a couple of point adjustments have been made. The Daedalus Fortified Tether ship is now 235, the Oedipus is 280, but it has a good reason to do so because it has gained the ability to cancel cards, and the three new entries are of course the Kepler Superiority Battlecruiser clocking in at 235 points, you've got the Low Fast Explorer at 230. 30 and a Xenophon Battlecruiser, the one that the box set is named after, clocking in at 210. There's also a small adjustment to the Plinius support carrier, which is now 130 points. There has also been a quite useful upgrade to the Chrono Generator in this one. If you are lucky enough to get a, uh, an exploding hit on your dice result, you can now choose any one of the results below and apply it. Uh, it's the double hit now that removes a single point of damage from every model in the unit, and if you still need it, the single hit now gains uh, or gives that unit plus one speed and fray for the duration of the activation. And if you get a counter, the unit gains plus two dice to a single action dice pool in this activation, while blank still gives the unit a level of disorder, but that definitely puts chrono generators in an interesting spot if you ask me. There was also a slight tweak to Luminiferous defenses, it still pretty much works as before, however you can now use uh, the non-crippled value uh, for ADV for mass 1 units, and uh, you cannot make a defense dice pool that is greater than 6 if you're uh, defending against gunnery and broadsides, so they have actually put a hard cap on how much Luminiferous defenses can, uh, can help you if you're using your defensive dice pool, which is, I think, justified, because especially with ma mass one vehicles. It could get out of hand pretty quickly. And very important to one of the entries that we'll be checking out as well, if you have a turbo encabulation drive, you're normally always forced to choose the blank result if you uh, take a void test, but this is now unless you're using a superior void engine, which one of the three builds actually has. And that leads us to the first entry I'll be discussing, the Low Fast Explorer. I'm discussing this one first because this is actually the build that I will be going for. Clocking in at only 230 points for 12 hull points, armor 7, citadel 13. Might sound like it's a bit expensive, but I have to admit with Luminiferous defenses being as good as they are these days, it's not going to be sank instantly. In addition, with uh, mass 3 and speed 6, you are talking about quite a fast ship, but with turn 3, don't expect it to be very maneuverable. However, you can still use your uh, superior void engine if you want to as well, and this one uh, yeah, can definitely be used to ship a different unit quite fast as well, which is why I very much like this entry. Um, you can give it a small unit of, uh, of Merian frigates, for instance, teleport them across the battlefield uh, to get a nice little alpha strike going, which is very fun gameplay to do so with the Enlightened, if a bit risky, but uh, yeah, its superior void engine definitely protects against the randomness and that's not all, uh, because otherwise you would just be taking a Newton Void Cruiser, obviously. Uh, it also has an SRS capacity of 5.3, which is uh, pretty darn good, because SRS 
both have a lot of utility, which is great to get in this uh, cheap a, uh, a cruiser. And uh, yeah, you can also still send out a decent attack wave with five SRS as well. Um, and yeah, you almost always want to have some SRS in any list that you build, especially if you're going up with something that has Fog of War. And uh, yeah, this ship does that. It is very similar to the Falkenstein in the Imperium list that way. And uh, for that reason alone, I like the Low Fast Explorer a lot. It doesn't just end there though, there's additional utility to this ship. There is the Flak Barrage 8, which is uh, pretty handy to defend against enemy SRS as well. On top of the Hydrophone Relay, uh, although this ship probably doesn't want to get super close to the enemy, it is nice to have uh, in your arsenal as well. The single particle beamer that this ship has isn't really going to do you any, uh, <laughs> isn't going to do any major damage. But the precognizant torpedo salvo, the heavy torpedo salvo that it has, is pretty good. So you're not taking this ship for your direct damage output at all, but it brings a lot to the table for an enlightened force, and that is why I will be building this one with this box set because, well, it is the entry that speaks to me the most. It's not the only entry they have, they also have the Kepler Superiority Battlecruiser and again if you're using magnets you'll definitely be able to swap between these parts quite easily. Kepler Superiority is at 235 points, has a lot more firepower because it has two particle beamers but it also comes with a heavy particle cannon for an additional blast weapon as well should you so desire. This ship is a lot more straightforward to pilot uh, compared to the uh, the low, um, so it might be good for uh, beginning players. However, if you're more of an experienced uh, enlightened player, I think you're probably better off getting on. Tarctica Superiority Cruiser, or even the Belgica for that matter, if you want one of these ships. Um, it is definitely a step up given its increased toughness, and it comes with the uh, Flak Barrage, the Hellion Cohort, and the Lamarckian Barracks as well, giving it a bit more oomph in the boarding actions. But uh, compared to the other cruisers, I don't think it's bringing enough to the table to really entice me that much. Not a bad entry by any stretch of the imagination, just perhaps not interesting enough compared to what the other options in the Orbat bring. It does come with uh, an initial point of Citadel though, so there is some increased uh, toughness compared to uh, the low ship that I mentioned as well, but yeah, it's, uh, it's perhaps not enough to convince me. And then finally, the cheapest entry of the three of them, Xenophon Battlecruiser, comes in at 210 points. It comes with three particle beamers, which does mean that you can make good use of that heavy firepower roll that it has, but it does lose a bit of utility compared to the other ships. It only comes with uh, Flak Barrage 6 as an additional uh, utility rule, so uh, also quite straightforward, but really the sort of entry you want if you make if you want to make a second uh, faction battle fleet, for instance, to use uh, the uh, the advanced rules for bringing in reserves. After all, strategic reserves is still very much a viable tactic for the Enlightened, because uh, it does hurt a lot if you bring in one of those uh, small Merian frigate uh, sort of chassis into the game, because uh, it doesn't matter if they have to shoot uh, their main weapon using the crippled profile, they're doing that anyway, so strategic reserves doesn't hurt the Enlightened that much compared to other factions. And so the Xenophon Battlecruiser is definitely one that I could still see having a place in uh, quite a few Enlightened lists that want to toy around with, uh, with that rule. And there we have it, those are the three new entries that are in the Enlightened Orbat 3.07. Overall, the Enlightened are in a much better spot than they were a couple of months ago. The Enlightened suffered a bit from having too many complex rules that were perhaps a bit over-costed, um, meaning that a, a beginning player had a hard time getting the most out of this faction, and those issues definitely have been addressed. That was recently uh, discussed as well amongst the war hosts that uh, they we're having a much tougher time beating the Enlightened, which is not a nice thing to have to say, but uh, <laughs> they were in a rough spot, and now they've sort of broken free from that. 
Anyway, that was it for me for this video. Apologies for not having made in, uh, a lot of content in the last few weeks. We've been away abroad for a very long time, and uh, when we came back, my day job is being a teacher, we were hit with the unfortunate news that we were getting a big inspection at work, so things have been incredibly, incredibly hectic, uh, getting everything in order. But that seems that's now all behind us. It's all done. We passed it quite well. Uh, I should add, which is nice to say, and uh, yeah, that means that you'll be expecting a lot more content from me coming soon, especially with Armored Clash being just around the corner. I do hope to see you in the next video, and until then, bye!